Good morning. I'd like to welcome anyone who's visiting with us here this morning. We're grateful to have you with us and uh, welcome to anyone uh, on the live stream. I wanted to give a special thank you to Pastor uh, Ray Andreos, who brought us the Word of God last week. I've known Ray, I think we've ministered together for 30 years, and I've just watched him grow and mature in, in what he preached on last Sunday. And he was just the right man for the right time with the right message. And I hope your hearts were really uh, encouraged by what he brought to us. I was greatly blessed. Just one quick announcement. Community groups, the ones, some of the ones that I teach this week, uh, the Attributes of God at my house on Tuesday night is starting up. We're going to be meeting outside, so bring a chair. There's no sun. It's all shade, but bring a chair if you're attending that, and then the Young Marrieds will be kicking off uh, on Friday. As a church, we're currently studying through Romans. Uh, we finished chapter 3, and I, I've been praying about just preaching it again because I just love it and want to dig in one more time. It was just glorious to my own heart. It's orienting and disorienting times. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll begin Romans chapter 4. We're going to just, Paul's going to keep fleshing out this idea of faith because we're just so prone to live by the scene instead of faith in our God. So Paul's laboring hard to convince, to have our hearts just settled that we are justified. We are declared right with God by faith alone. This morning, uh, just the fruit of much prayer and thought uh, on this message is, is just um, giving you my heart uh, through this strange time that we've been through. And I just wanted to pull out of Romans and just kind of share what God's been doing. I want to shepherd you kind of through what we're facing uh, as a body, what, uh, what is mounting and growing in our country. And I really think they're just the tremors of the earthquake of persecution that is going to begin to come upon the church of God and the hardship. So we, we need to be prepared and we need to be ready. Well, when COVID hit, I was in California and I was praying, what should I preach on, Lord, when I get back? It was interesting that Ray was preaching that Sunday as well before I got back. But uh, I just wanted to come and unmask the threat that was very unknown at that point with COVID. And it was causing anxiety and some panic and fear in society and even in our own hearts. And just to, to stare it right in the face and go right to the root and not look at symptoms. So we went right to Philippians 1.21, where Paul's waiting to find out if they're going to cut his head off or not. And Paul says, for me to live is Christ. If the verdict is I get to go free, I'm going to live for Christ. He'll be my focus. And if the verdict is death and I die, it will be gain because I will get more of Christ. And so we just stared it right in the face and, and looking at the hope of the Christian. Then after Easter, we jumped back into Romans and when we, we looked at Romans 2 and 3 while you were locked up all alone at home of God exposing your sin, your lostness, and your need of the gospel. And we journeyed to those glorious words in Romans 3.21, but now. And we began looking at what God has done to remedy that problem of sin and destruction and the wrath of God that was upon us. And we've just been staring at the cross and the, the beauty of what Christ has done. And what happened to me during this season is the things of earth grew strangely dim. The unity that I've been drinking with the saints of God has been deep and rich because I, you're so dialed in because of the season that we're in, and I love that. So here's the burden then this morning of a shepherd's heart is I, I love this flock. I've spent 21 years just praying over it and preaching Jesus from every angle for your good. Some of you have been knocked off kilter during this season. And what I want to do this morning is I want to shepherd all of our hearts back to this place that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And so the only way a sheep would ever lie down is if they had no fears or worries. And there, there's a way as the people of God in the middle of anything that's going on to lie down in green pastures because God's your shepherd. And he has you and he's leading you and he's guiding and he's unfolding all of history. Nothing's taking him by surprise. And so this, this is where I want to shepherd us this morning into this place where Paul's driving us in Romans to peace with God and that we stand in grace. And so there, there's a way to just be in this shalom that God has promised for the people of God in Christ. So have you lost this? during this season. I, I just want you before God to examine your heart. Where is it at? 
That is more dangerous than COVID, government overreach, or loss of freedoms. It's to lose your freedom in Christ, to love God and love others. That's to lose all. And so I want to make sure that, that we don't lose that. And so what I want you to hear at home or sitting in the sanctuary, I'm not talking about having concerns and I'm not talking about having convictions. We, we believe that we should have convictions on all of these things. And it's not saying you can't have burdens, frustrations, cares, disappointments. You don't like the way your elders are guiding through this. You don't like the way your brothers and sisters are seeing what all's happening around us. I am talking this morning about losing your peace your peace in the middle of this. I'm talking about spending more time on social media than in the secret place with God. More fearful of COVID than sin. More worried about waking people up to what the government's doing than waking people up to their need of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so what I'm going to ask you is, what has your heart? What are you gripped by as you come in here this morning to worship? And I just want you to answer that before your God. Just you and God right here. Right now, and just pause for a second. Where's my heart in the middle of all of this? And I want to read to you James 1.19. James said, This you know, my beloved brethren. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. And when we studied that, that word for wickedness in the Greek, it meant wax in your ear. And so he tells us how we're in humility to receive the word of God. So when we come to hear the word of God, we actually can have wax in our ears so we can't hear what's being preached. The word of God is proclaimed and because of sin and frustration or whatever it is, it's, it's wax in your ears and you're just not taking in the word of God the way you should. So I wanted to start just by asking, have, have you done this? Is God silent and the world is loud right now? Romans 3 did nothing for me on the cross of Christ. It just bounced off my angry, worried, frustrated heart. Boom. I can't even hear the good shepherd anymore because I'm so frustrated. Will you just start here then with me this morning? You won't hear anything. You can't because nothing can break through that wax if you sit in that place. You can't receive the word in humility. And so I, I want to I go back. If you just got to be right or you're frustrated, your mind and your heart will not be able to receive the word of God. And so what if you're exactly right in your assessment? It will bear the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And if you're wrong in how you're thinking about this, even if you're right in your assessment, it will produce the deeds of the flesh and it will be outbursts of anger and dissensions and factions will be the fruit of what will come out of your heart. So let's start, as Ray preached last week, where we are unified this morning. And so I'm wanting as much of God as possible. I want to know God as much as a human can know this side of glory. And, 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 and to confess our sin and to hear the word of God and just say, God, will you, will you speak to me? It's been a while, and I miss you. I want green pastures with everything around me in chaos, and I want to lie down again. And that is where the good shepherd wants to lead you, and that is where your shepherd wants to lead you this morning. So I would like to open just with a a word of prayer, and then we'll open up the word of God. Father, I pray, Lord, that our hearts, that we would just begin in repentance if we've been holding frustrations and even enmity in our heart towards government, towards leaders, towards people in our body. God, if there's anything that we just have drifted from this sweet place of, of being one with you, being accepted in this gospel, I just pray this morning that we would let everything go. We repent. Let us hear. Let us give us ears to hear this morning. Let us hear what the Spirit has to say from the word of God, and that we would receive this word in humility. And so God, would you work now in every heart with the passage we're about to look at? You know every need, and we ask that you would do it specific in each heart for what they need this morning. God, do what no man can do. 
We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, I want to share just a couple observations as we begin after 54 years of living in America, the land that I love. 250 years <coughs> since our Constitution, we've, had, we've enjoyed a rare time in the history of this world. Christianity has largely been accepted, and it's actually a very strong voice in our country for much of our history. There are many blessings upon the church and its members as a result. Being a Christian, for the most part, was viewed as normal. And our currency, it said, in God we trust. One nation under God. God bless America is the, is the quip. It was culturally accepted. Sundays when I grew up, everything was closed down. You couldn't do Little League sports. It was just a day for people to stop and worship God. And for the most part, even in the, like the Bible Belt, by being a Christian, things would go well for you and it would bring prosperity. One pastor said that this has produced a distortion, which was uh, subtly and outright, it's made us home here in this world. It's made us kind of settled in. We, we've, had, we've not had to endure intense and deep persecution and afflictions for the most part. Just a feeling of it's just going to go well for us as believers. We got our place. We got our land. We, we like being thought well of. Just kind of expect things to go well. That's the American dream. Christianity and the American dream are just such a nice marriage. America was upbeat and success and opportunity. Jimmy Carter, he said, we, we always believed as a nation that our best days were ahead of us. And this is the first time in the early 80s that we don't. Our Christianity gave us security. It gave us comfort and made us prosperous. Many peddled a, a false gospel. Come to Jesus and your life will be better. You can have the best life now. And Christianity has just become about how to have a nicer America and a better life. And in many ways, there's, there's some truth to that. The Bible says if you work hard, you're going to eat the fruit of it. And if you're lazy, you're going to eat the fruit of that. There are many sins that can destroy and deteriorate marriages and families and lose jobs over them. So there are certain kind of blessings that come by following after Jesus Christ. But to follow Christ in many ways made you a respected citizen among our communities. And it does bring blessing and success to some point then. I think that it brought blessing upon our country. There are many things we enjoy because of our foundations. But what happens when that's all you know? What happens when that's all you've ever known is that? John Piper says it gets out of proportion. You, you, you lose a, the, a proportion with that and suffering. The Christian American dream can become bigger than being with God forever. The promise that this gospel gives and what the promise of Hebrews is, it, it, it gets bigger to just have a nice life. And, and we don't want to suffer for his name's sake at any cost. Where many places in the world right now, it will cost you your life to follow Jesus and surely be rejected by your society and your government. There's been more martyrs in the last hundred years than the 2000 before. If another kind of season comes upon a country that has enjoyed 250 years of this stuff, it could be scary and it can be arresting and something we're not prepared for or experienced at. And we can make our main focus, let's keep it the way it was for 250 years. We got to fight. We got to hold to the constitution, our laws, our reforms, our rights. That's got to be our chief end. We, we can't let it get away. I love these 250 years. So let's be about the church and keep America that way. I have people say, I don't want to have kids in a country like this anymore. After 54 years, I don't want to have kids in the country that I, they grew up in anymore. It was hard to raise them where they don't know any kind of persecution. Because what we knew was it was not the norm. What, what America had is not the norm in the history of our country. It was not what Jesus promised. He said, if you follow after me, they're going to hate you. And they're going to say all kinds of evil and they're going to seek to kill you to shut your light out. Jesus promised that. 
If they treated me that way, they're going to treat you that way if you follow me. If, by God's providence, he brings us back into a normal setting in history where you got to suffer and suffer deeply for the name of Jesus Christ and be rejected by your society and thought a fool for following after this name and thrown in prison if you preach against this culture. Your government and society will see that you rather than applaud you. There's not true justice in our land. There's a reversal of right and wrong and we parade around evil constantly. <clears throat> what will you do? Your parenting is going to have to change. You're going to need to teach your kids how to endure this and you're going to have to begin to think about a whole new way. That you didn't come to Jesus to have a better life here. What is the norm? How do we endure the norm then as it comes upon us of persecution? How are we going to endure it? How do we keep our peace and confidence and hope in the midst of the stuff that we're facing? And the stuff that we're facing is not even close to what is the norm. Not even close. And so here's my prayer. God, fix the distortion that we've all grown up in. You're going to have to. And what we know so well that our flesh longs for, our flesh repudiates persecution and pain. We want comfort and we want security and we want approval. And for many of us, religion brought that. Our churches have taught us how to seek for that and have nothing press up against it. Just give you verses and nice little thoughts and pleasantries on your, your little uh, love boat sailing to glory. We hate the idea of a battleship with all of society against us. We are the enemy and we're hated and we will be persecuted if we live the life Jesus called us to live. We're an alien. There's a cost. Jesus said you need to take up your cross if you're going to be my disciple. And you're going to be repudiated by many in our churches every Sunday. And I'll tell you this, I hate how much growing up in this has affected my own heart. I prayed for the revival of 2020 and God started showing me in my own heart. We have a brother that we sent out to the mission field named Rodney and the government would love to destroy him. ISIS is constantly a threat. And I always wonder why every time he comes back to America, why he's so taken back because of what we're going to talk about this morning. And so I want you to come with me because that is what is going on in the book of Hebrews is I've never seen it so clearly. As I'm reading through Hebrews, the, there are Jews who are coming to believe in Jesus. And as they believe in him, they're losing everything. They're losing their families, their society, their synagogues. Everything they've ever known now is persecuting them, rejecting them. And they're, they're, they're having this amazing cost to follow Jesus. And some of them, it's so intense. If I go back, it will take off the persecution. It will lighten up. And so the, the writer of Hebrews is writing to show you there's something so beautiful in Christ. And if you realize your reward and what's coming at the end of this, you need to hold on. Don't let go. This is too good. The, the cost to follow Jesus will never be greater than the reward. And so the writer is just saying, look how beautiful Jesus is. Look what he's going to give you and bring you. Why would you go back? Why would you walk away? You need to endure and persevere. That's what this whole book is about. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews, I think, is a pastor. He knew this group so well. And he's seeking to help them. And, and he wants to shepherd them through this, like I'm trying to do in Romans 3, in the middle of all this. Look at the cross. Look at Jesus. Let him heal you. Let that be enough in the middle of everything you're facing. The superiority of Christ. Don't go back. He's, he's what all of history pointed to. He's a greater revelation. The writer says he's greater than the angels. He gives a greater rest, an eternal rest. He's a greater priest. He has a greater covenant that you'll never be separated from his love. A greater sacrifice one time pays an eternal redemption. And he has a greater than or greater relationship and access and fellowship. And the bottom line is you have a greater hope 
because of what you have in Jesus Christ. And I want you to, to notice an amazing connection here is the endurance. I need it. I'm soft. I hate to even admit it. When there was no toilet paper, I got nervous. Not sad. And when they said there might not be meat, I love, I'm not a vegetarian and I, was, I felt anxiety. I have a horrible immune system, half lung capacity. I don't want COVID. I don't want financial burden, hard times. It felt hard to me. <laughs> so how do we endure with what we're in and really what's coming? Turn with me to Hebrews 10. This connection has is, is been a life changer for me. The writers just laid out all that Christ is. And in 1019, he uses a therefore. In light of this gospel of what God has done in Christ, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Jesus, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, sins washed away, separated, and our bodies washed with pure water, wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. Verse 23 then, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Don't let go of your hope. Don't waver with all the persecution and all that's coming against you. You have a blessed, eternal hope. God's faithful. God, in this book, in chapter 6, he took an oath by himself. I swear by God that I will keep my promise. To the one who comes to Jesus will receive this eternal inheritance. It, it, he's faithful. He's going to do it. Verse 24, let us consider then how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let's stir one another up then to, to not get lost in all of this, to love God, love each other in good deeds of serving and helping each other, as he's said throughout this book, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so it's a day where we're going to be tempted to quit meeting. And more than ever, we got to gather because when we gather, we're going to try to stimulate one another to love and good deeds and not lose our hope of what we have in Christ. Because every day I go out in this world, it tells me to hope in something else. And we gather to keep reminding each other, this is what our real hope is. Here we have no lasting city, but that's our hope. And that establishes the church and why it must gather. Verse 26, four, and I, most of you know this, but you don't start sentences with four. This is an explanation of what I just read. So connect the thought. For if you go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. And he'll lay out and finish in verse 31. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And now what he just established, I don't want you to miss. Don't forsake the assembling together. Because if you go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of Christ, you're going to damn yourself. And what he's saying then is we, we gather to not let us drift into sin and stay in it and love it and hide it and just do be the lone ranger. We need each other to keep us from, from drifting and falling into sin and destroying ourselves. And so we gather and we got to help each other fight sin and to stir each other up to love and good deeds. We need each other. And then the heart of what I'm going to look at this morning in the next section is we need, we need endurance. We, we need to stick at this. And there's people who, who are walking away from Jesus Christ during this time. And we got we to gotta hold to the end for the prize. So I want you to listen to verse 32. I, you know, I won't even read it actually, because that's what we're going to look at this morning. What he's going to say is you have need of endurance. You, you got to endure. So we gather to help each other, keep your hope and endure to the very end and finish with your hope in Jesus Christ. So let's take a look then. I, I, I need you guys to help me endure. We need each other 
to help endure. And I just don't think people are afraid enough of that. In the end days, most people's love is going to grow cold. And you got to get serious that we got we to dig in. We must dig in. This is bigger than whether you wear a mask or not. This is bigger whether you have hydroxychloroquine or not. This is bigger than the government is training us just for greater control. Hitler stuff is just around the corner. This is whether I endure to the end. And I want that to be the burden of your heart and receive the reward that God has promised to his children for those who are faithful to the end and wouldn't let go of Jesus. And so I want you to see that I shared in the earlier service, one of the godliest women I know at the church, she shared with me, I, I was losing my first love and I, I couldn't get it back. And the, the last two sermons of looking at the cross in Jesus, God finally broke through and my love has just been ignited again. And so I just, I need you to, to realize why this is so important. It's not, you get a milkshake at the end of this. You get eternal life with God forever. And that better mean something. And that better be of value. And that means I better gather. And I need people to stir me up unto love and good deeds so I don't continue in sin and not finish the race. And again, we all, we believe here at Southside that the believer will make it to the end. God will lose none. But he also exhorts you that you better make it to the end. And you got to take this serious and you better fight and just quit sitting around spending more time looking at social media than the secret place. This is a call for wake up. We need each other. Gather, help each other to not lose sight of the prize. So this morning, this, that was all introduction and you guys are used to that. If you're visiting, get used to it. I, I just got long introductions and I, I just, I can't seem to break out of it. So this morning, the writer of Hebrews will help us to endure by considering three things. This is a message about endurance. And he wants you to consider your past. He wants you to consider your future. And that's going to give you some, some grit in your present. And so we're going to look at the past, future, and present. So look with me in verse 32 at your past. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering. So remember your former days. What, are, what that word remember means go back in the past, remember something in such a way that it affects you in the present. It's the same word when Jesus at the table said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what I did at the cross to where it brings your present reality of love to Christ. Remember what? When after being enlightened, that's when the, the gospel burst forth. God said, let there be light. And you saw the glory of God in the face of Christ. And you believed in him and you were saved. Grass was greener. Sky was bluer. You just let there be light. And you saw the beauty of Jesus Christ. So when you were saved... He says, you endured a great conflict of suffering. Not many of us had that. Some that just isn't a description. But for these believers, when they got saved, they were ushered in to great conflicts of suffering. The Greek word for conflict, it, it, it referred to uh, an athletic term of wrestling. And when you would wrestle, the, you, you literally had to wrestle. Whoever lost was killed. And so picture how hard you would wrestle if you knew your life was at stake, if you got pinned. And that's the word here is you, you endured this, this battle, this contest, and it's in the plural form. You had a bunch of them. You had many of these conflicts come upon you. And so you came to faith in Christ and it just brought you into the realm of hardship and suffering. Early church. And what does he say? You endured. It was tough, but you never let go of Christ. You held to him through that season and this is their pastor, I believe, telling them, God was faithful to you, and he's been faithful to us. I'd love if we had the time for everyone to stand up and share the faithfulness of God in your life. To think and look back and reflect and trust God then in the present. God has brought you through every high and stormy gale, through many trials, dangers, snares, toils. For us, tough times. There's been some with persecution, some hard trials, look back and you see how God has brought you through it. And to help us even more, the writer's going to now give us a description of what that suffering was. 
He wants them to bring it back to mind to help us with what they're facing right now and the same for us as the children of God. So what I want you to see here, there's two groups. First group, he says, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations. You were a public uh, spectacle, and this word had reference to a theater. And it meant to be put up on a stage for derision and ridicule, for insults and reproaches. Some people seem to think it might have been the arena where they were fed to the lions and the Christians were devoured right there in that arena in Rome. The word's used in two other places. If you'll look with me, flip over to Hebrews eleven twenty four. 24. <clears throat> By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. All the the world was at his hands by being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he he said, I'll take take, um, suffering with the people of God instead. Why? In verse 26, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to what? He was looking to the reward. And so he, he said, I've got something better than everything. I could have everything this world could afford. And I'm, I'm going to give that up and suffer with the people of God because the reward that I have at the end of this is God forever. Through reproaches, the Greek word means false charges or ridicule. Tribulations meant squeezings and sufferings and torture. So you guys are ridiculed and mocked and you're tortured and you're suffering for the name of Jesus. And this is the whole world. The government is taking Christians and mocking them and putting them to death for sport in horrific ways when the writer is writing this. Guys, this is the distortion of America. We we just don't know this. And the second group, he says, partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. This word, Koinonia is you had fellowship. You were one with those who were being treated that way. You're you're a family. We're we're a family and we, we stick together and we help each other suffer. We don't turn on each other and say, you're afraid. Well, you're critical. And you start turning and accusing the brethren this is a time where you come together. But the writer of Hebrews says, your, your knees are weak and feeble. Come and strengthen them. This is the time where the body of Christ helps each other. If you're afraid, we help you. If you're struggling, we, we encourage each other. We don't start shooting each other. This is the time where, where they had koinonia and they united and they were one in the gospel and they, they had sympathy for those who were in prison and being made spectacles and all that they were going. If one of us suffer, we all suffer. This is the church. This is how we get through this. This is our means of grace to endure is that we pray for each other and encourage and help each other. This is so beautiful what's going on in Hebrews. Listen to verse 34. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. Brothers and sisters are being thrown into prison. What was this? Well, we all know that Stephen was martyred in Acts. We have Nero who was putting Christians up on, on, on little posts, pouring pitch on them and lighting them on fire at his parties. There, he was crucifying Christians on these roads. They would just be ha- hanging all over. There was an amazing persecution under Nero. Claudius in 49 AD forced all the Christians out of Rome and they lost all their property. And you had to make a decision. If I stand with them, I might be next. So this isn't little. You might be the light at Nero's party next. And I could play it safe and I'll just pray for him at home. But this was the body of Christ. And I'm sure they chose to pray, but they chose to stand with them and share with them. And the prisons then, you had no help. They didn't give you food. They didn't give you a cloak. You were dependent on others outside of bringing your meals and and just a blanket. You were dependent and you showed sympathy to those who were suffering in prison. And by showing this kindness to those in prison and sharing with them, guys, it came at a great cost. 
There's a sacrifice to love the brethren. And I want you to hear what was the cost. The seizure of your property. By identifying with these brothers and sisters in Christ, that you're Christians. And what that word really meant were followers of Christ. They took your house. Most likely the government because they were put in prison and they had the authority to take your house. And I just want to ask you this, what would happen in our day if they came and took your house? We're undone. What would you do? I want you to really think about what would you do if they came tomorrow to take your house for identifying with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Some of you would be bunkered in with your guns and you would be come out shooting. But there's a word I couldn't get past all week. It's the word joyfully. I want you to just look at that. Joyfully. Their rights and their possessions were taken. They were driven out of their land. And I, I've wrestled. What would I do? Joyfully. Peter's in prison being beaten and he rejoiced to suffer for the name of Jesus. It's so un-American. I mean, this is so un-American. It's crazy. And because of our distortion, we can't see this. Because of what we've known as a country, we can't get this. Joyfully. And so what I've been asking myself all week, how do you do that? How do you get to this? That's my second point, the future. The writer here says, knowing. Knowing. In verse 34. And it's a, kind of that, that um, full knowledge. It's, a, it's a intimate. It's knowing. It's not just academic facts. Because I'm telling you, your doctrine, just knowing it in your head, you're never going to do this joyfully. This is someone who knows Christ and knows their inheritance. They know this. They get this. This is my inheritance. Knowing, what does he say? That you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Here's what you got to know intimately when this comes. That you have a better possession. That's been the whole book of Hebrews. You got a better rest. Here we have no lasting city. We're seeking the one to come. Abraham, it says he was looking for the city whose builder and maker is God. And the whole uh, Hebrews 11 was just people who had their hope fixed on the, the prize. They, they never got it, but they kept looking and waiting for it. You got to know that you got a better possession coming. There's something better than America at its best. I lived under Ronald Reagan. What glorious years. I'll take Jesus Christ any day over Reagan. Hallelujah. This is better than my house. Do you believe this? This is better than those in my house. This is a call to, I want this. You can take anything away from me except Jesus Christ. I hold everything loosely. And if you take it for the name of Jesus Christ, I joyfully give it to you because I have something better. And you can't touch it. <laughs> Governments can't take away Jesus Christ, I have a better possession. Take away my house, my chariot, my possessions, and I have something better than this that the world can't take away from me. I fear nothing but God. You can't take away my inheritance. What is there to fear? Moth and rust are going to destroy whatever it is you're clinging to. But this one is a better inheritance. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. And secondly, it's lasting. When we've been there 10,000 days, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Forever. And my question that I ask myself all week that I'm going to ask you is, do you, do you believe this? It's amazing that I got to ask the church of God, do you believe this? Because what, what's going on is, we're finding that we, we, we wanted America to be our hope, our homeland, our country, it, first and foremost. And so now you're faced with a question. What are you living for? What really is your hope? Best life now? If you do it joyfully, 
you are right now hoping in something better. And if you're angry, (laughs) if you don't hope in this, you're angry and you're scared that you might lose everything that really matters to you. That's your real fear. I can't, that's my real God. And I, I can't lose it. And so I'm very protective and fearful and angry because that's what I really want instead of joyfully. I already lost it all. I've been crucified with Christ. I gave everything to him when I came to Christ. It's all yours. It's his to be used at his discretion. This is a little practice run. And I mean little. It's going to show you much about where your hope is. Is it here in our little America? Or are we looking for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells forever? See, I can live in the middle of unrighteousness and injustice and hatred toward Christians in this little dot to get that everlasting one that's going to come at the end. Knowing this, I can joyfully have anything taken away from me because the only thing that matters, the most important thing is Jesus Christ and my inheritance and it cannot be taken away. What's your hope? I'm going to ask you a dirty question, but I'm your pastor. Would your life prove it the last four months? If someone walked around and heard your conversations the last four months, what would they conclude? If they looked at your posts, they watched your body language at meetings, (laughs) would they ask you, what's the hope within you? Or would they say, why are you so frustrated? Because what this world needs right now is to see a people who have a hope past this and are at peace and and gathering and loving each other. That's what they need to see. And that's what we can offer. And they're going to say, what's the hope within you? Third point, the present. I'm going to close out quickly with this. If you look with me at verse 36, Verse 36, therefore, don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Don't let that go. You have need of endurance. You got to keep at it. You got to keep running. You got shin splints and cramps. And he's saying, run the race that's set before you. Keep running. You have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised, eternal life with God. For in a very little while, he who is coming will come. Jesus is coming back and he will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. In the middle of all this stuff going on, I will live by faith in these truths and in these promises. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we believers are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. We're not going to let go. We're going to run to the very end because of the grace of God. And so we're not those who chuck it and quit. But wake up. Don't live in sin and hide and pet it. And stay away from the body of Christ. It looks a little different than it's looked. But there's still, we're gathering. And we're able to encourage and help each other and stimulate one another to love and good deeds and not let you go apostate. (laughs) not let you go on sinning willfully. And we we help each other so that we might never lose this hope and hold it till we draw our last breath and enter in to that hope. That's what the church is about, not your best life now. I pray that's what you want. If you want that, that's what we're going to fight for. And I want to close with an example. And Hebrews 11 is just full of them. But I want to close with one from right from our church. I got a dear brother named Howard Tiffany. I know there's a few visitors. Howard, uh, his wife was like the matriarch of our church. Just a godly, godly woman. She was a picture of life and health. And she caught COVID. And she is now with the Lord. And Howard caught it as well. And Howard had to be locked up in his house for almost a month, I think it was, with no family, no friends, no church. Just locked up with his wife in a hospital, praying, wondering if God will heal her. 
And all these questions that are thrown out in the media, do respirators kill people? If you have hydrodroxychloroquine, uh, it, could, it could heal you. And all this stuff gets thrown around. And Howard, sitting at a table with coffee, he said, God took her at the exact time that he decreed. God doesn't make mistakes. He, he took my wife exactly when he wanted to and when he wanted and when he decreed and when it should happen. I don't have any questions. There's not, what about this? What if this? God took my wife exactly on his timing. He couldn't even go see her. Couldn't go in a hospital. He's locked up. And he joyfully accepted the taking of his greatest possession, his wife, because he had a better hope. And he said that Jeannie just wanted to be with Christ. That's all she ever talked about. And his hope is now she got her reward. And I'm going to go get that same reward with her one day. Thank you, Howard, and the many other saints who have taught me this in this journey. The lady who sat over her son's casket with all the grandchildren crying over it, worshiping Jesus Christ right there. Guys, if we're not going to be the gathered church who hopes in this, that takes up its cross and dies, and stirs each other to love and good deeds, to lose our lives rather than save them. Then, and then in Malachi, he says, why don't you just shut the doors? If we're just going to play American Christianity, just shut the doors. Let's stop. Who cares if the government closes us? Maybe they're doing the world a service. They're closing down dead corpses called the church, hoping for a better America. I'm hoping for a better possession that will abide forever. And I, I want to come and help me fight to not let my hope ever drift until I breathe my last breath. Help me. And don't let me distract me with America that's not so beautiful. And so I'm going to ask you, will you hope in this? And help each other daily to stay fixed on this hope and bring as many people with us into this hope. And let's teach another generation how to hope in this. And get into this world and get people to this hope. So my application, have babies. <laughs> have babies and let, let's teach them how to hope in this. Don't be afraid of this world. There's a Christ. Have babies. Point them to this and teach them that there's a cost and it's worth it. Turn with me. I'm going to just read a couple verses and we'll finish. Hebrews 11, 13. This will be our application. 11.13, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear they're not seeking a country of their own. They're not seeking America. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. And that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. Hebrews eleven thirty five. 35. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings and chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted and they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts, deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground for the name of God. Hebrews 12.1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with what? Endurance. The race that is set before us. How do I do it? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy, listen to that, the joy set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand at the throne of God. For consider him 
who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. And I want you to flip over to chapter 13, verse 12, and we'll, we'll be done. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the city which is to come. And so I pray that we will help each other endure looking for that city that's better and to bring as many with us as possible. And I'm not after making America great again. Okay? I want to I wanna make the church great <laughs> that hopes in this and believes it and fights for it and helps each other quit grabbing this world and trying to smile and just, you know, I can have Jesus and the world. That's all I want. I want to, that dies to that and follows after Jesus and makes that your chief end and what you're going to run after. It's time to stop playing games and to be the people of God and hope in this alone because the days are, they're coming and, and persecution is mounting and, and we need to, to be ready and the way to be ready is we have a better possession and an abiding one. Knowing that, we will endure to the end. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this gospel. I thank you for this hope. God, let us not hope in temporal things. Let us not hope in what we've known for 250 years. God, let, let those things, the distortion that has hurt us, to think that that's normal. And so when it's not normal, we don't know what to do. God, let us begin to enter into what your Bible says is normal. That those who live godly will be persecuted and suffer for the name of Christ. God, let us rise up and be done with lesser things and give heart and mind and soul and voice to serve the King of Kings. God, I pray, help us. Unite us. Unite us as one to help each other endure to the end. And don't let us get lost in lesser things. Oh God, fix our, our, our gaze. Let it be steadfast on the sweet Christ. I thank you. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen.